Maybe we can start. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to kick this off. So today I'm going to talk to you about the uh, about, um, case study that we had at Disney Garden. It's the new um, Medicine on Frontier uh, website. And this talk's going to be mostly focused around user experience in early development, although we're going to touch a bit about a couple of things. So, start a bit about me. Um, my name is Duarte. I work at Digital Garden, which is a Sydney-based agency that specializes in Drupal, but focuses quite a lot on user experience. Um, I'm the technical director there. I come from Portugal. You know, in Australia around four years now. Um, and I've been working in Drupal for more or less seven years. So I've been forced as a part of the community that as well. And I'm the author of Webform Panels and I'm currently maintaining the user Discord module as well. So the team that work on this project, um, I was mostly involved um, managing the project as it was a pretty specific Drupal project. Uh, it needed a bit of a technical input as well. So I was basically providing a bit of a tech leading um, as well as managing. Joanne, our lead UX designer, was pretty much in charge of all the user experience activities as well as designing the interface. We have Elliot Mitchum, or kind of our guru front-end developer, <laughs> that was in charge of creating this a beautiful Drupal 7 mobile first responsive team. And Abby Brakewell, our managing director, which is now kind of in the account management. So the brief. So MSF the protest um, with their old website, they wanted to switch to Drupal. MSF International is already using uh, Drupal on a lot of projects. Um, and they wanted to have a mobile first responsive website based on the existing MSF Ireland build. So MSF Ireland was kind enough to provide the build that they were using currently. And our job was to try and minimize changes to the backend build and just focus on design and user experience and creating a new Drupal 7 theme. So a bit about the background of the project. This is what they had before. I'll show you guys a bit more detail later. Uh, but as you can see, one of the main issues was really on the IA and the information architecture. It was quite confusing. Uh, it was full of industry jargon, which sometimes, especially in the NGOs, tends to be the case. They, they just kind of drill down on that approach. They're too involved um, in, in their own um, language and sometimes forget a bit about you know, who's using the website. Um, so there is a lot of large quantity of irrelevant content as well. Um, and it's one of the things that we wanted to address with a new content strategy for, for an asset of Australia. Uh, if you look at the homepage, for example, you can see that there's nothing, there's no hierarchy in this homepage. There's, um, if, you, if you try and look at this and try to you know, find your donate buttons or how to join your team, it's pretty blend into the rest of the website. So we really wanted to try and create a hierarchy of content to try and prioritize things and, and to understand what are the main goals, what are the secondary goals, and make that reflect into the whole user experience and design process. Um, the, the previous website uh, that they were going to be using was user type of free CMS, and that was another thing that they were really keen on changing to have kind of a workflow from an editorial perspective that really makes it easy to update content. Um, and they were extremely excited to start using Google for that. Um, obviously, it was a non responsive website, and they fixed the design. Um, they did make some, some adaptations to some templates because, you know, people making donations, so let's, let's create, you know, a couple of pages and make them responsive. But then obviously that creates another problem, which is quite a disconnect between the user journey. So you're traveling through this, you know, mobile website and then you want to see a bit more information and all of a sudden you get a best operation. And that wasn't really producing very good results. Um, so, outline of the project. A mobile first was, was key. This is one of the main things on the brief. They really wanted to start on a mobile first approach. It was a, kind of a new thing for them as well. Uh, obviously responsive. And they wanted to take a content first user centered approach. Um, they wanted to really fix some of the mistakes that I made in the past on not thinking about their, their audience and basically only, only thinking about it. kind of internal agendas and objectives so each department had their own goals and they start competing against each other and then in the end what you see on the homepage that's what it is and instead of you know what do users want, what do they need out of the MSF. Um, obviously Drupal CMS, a big part of the project and we wanted to make sure that we try to reuse as much functionality as possible with what, what was already there and if we were going to make changes to try and make them as broad as possible and you know, get new content types, how can we reuse features of each content type important across. Uh, so the content strategy, 
Um, this, this was the key, I think, the core, at the very core of the entire user experience project. Um, the new design should bring out the best of the new website content strategy, stories first, Australian and New Zealand papers. So this was really the main thing. They wanted to switch the way they were communicating to their audience. And, and the content strategy that they were envisioning was something that was built around storytelling, which is obviously quite more more bit attractive from several perspectives. So the three pillars that we were going to follow in terms of content strategy would be to prioritize first-person stories from st staff and patients instead of just more institutional news. We wanted to prioritize content that it was mostly relevant to Australia and New Zealand instead of quite uh, a bulk of international content. Um, and we wanted to make the most of, of great photography and video content that, um, that MSF has available. They're probably one of the best uh, photography databases in the world. So starting the project, the beginning of the project was the discovery phase. Uh, and this is a series of several workshops, research activities. We're really trying to understand a bit more about what is it that we're really trying to achieve. So not just what we want to do, we want to build a website, we want to make it responsive, but why? And start asking the questions and understanding what are the organizational goals and what are the main things and what are the secondary things. So we would look at um, things like business rules, target audiences, competitive landscape, and we'll create kind of a, a, an internal brief that would serve as to the entire user experience part where we start prototyping and so on. So main goals and objectives. The first thing that we identified, not surprisingly, is the two main goals is donations, increasing donations, making donations more prominent, uh, and increasing the volunteer base of uh, the NSO. Um, so these were the, the two main things that we really wanted to push through the entire project. Secondary goals, increasing engagement through storytelling. So people reading more of the NSF stories, starting to see some stats that can prove that you know, the assumption that was about and the hypothesis around storytelling as a common strategy would prove um, truthful. Uh, and the second secondary goal would be to increase subscriptions from the market to, to kind of help the, the marketing department and MSF to um, go and, and you know, communicate better with users so that they can basically increase the main goals of MSF through marketing activities, media campaigns and so on, and start pushing more donations, more um, joining our team. So in terms of key tasks, we wanted to make sure that we had an accessible information architecture. We wanted to improve navigation mechanics. Uh, we, I'll show you a bit more about um, some usability testing that was done before we started the project, which is good so we have some terms of comparison. Um, but they have this kind of drop-line style menu, which people, you know, when you start hovering and it disappears, it creates like frustration. Many of us put it almost invisible. Um, so people just, you know, it's kind of a bit of text in the middle of the page. Um, and they wanted to really have, um, especially on the homepage, to be really goal focused. So instead of internal agendas kind of competing against each other, uh, really trying to understand if these are our goals and if these are our main goals and secondary goals, they want to make sure that our homepage will reflect this. Um, and I can show you that. Let's see where it is. Way back machine, but I have to switch computers. Um, so basically, w what you could, sh could see on the homepage is if you try and understand what's more important from the old MSF website, you will be kind. There's you know, buttons with donations kind of spread everywhere, there's buttons to join that team, and this is in the middle of quite a lot of stuff. So we wanted to make it really clean and simple uh, and make users not have to fight for every information to try and find them. Some look and feel guidelines that, that will pass through the brief as well. So we want to obviously increase call to action prominence. Uh, this is some of the parts of the new design. You can see that uh, the PR team and the nation part is starting to come, kick a bit out of the information architecture instead of just being another menu link. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, the call to actions present on every page, but also when you're scrolling down. So adding some sort of sticky navigation so that wherever you are, you want to make sure that the main goals are always present in one click away. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had obviously compliance with branding guidelines. They have this huge um, brief from a branding guidelines perspective, as you can imagine. So we want to make sure that whatever we did was compliant with that, but we wanted to try and kind of make things a bit fresher and a bit different than your usual NSF um, look and feel. Um, they were striving for a flat modern look, which is kind of you know, what, what we're all doing on several websites that we're building nowadays, kind of less imagery, more kind of CSS-based um, interface. 
faster cleaner and, and, and really helps promote the point of the building as well before. And then we work considerations between the classic, you know, color scheme versus a bit more modern scheme, like black versus black. Uh, we wanted to try and test a couple of different fonts that we have available. And we wanted to make sure that everything that we did here was mobile first. So instead of, you know, starting to mock up some design things, we wanted to just start wireframing and start with mobile only. And some clients might sometimes find that a bit challenging when, you know, you come to them and, and just show them this mobile screen and, and, not, and not, not really think about desktop yet. But it really helps. And I'll show you why you really believe in that approach. So if we... Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so some references that, that we pulled uh, from them and from us as well. Um, so obviously being one of the biggest NGOs on their space, um, there's a lot that we can pull from, from other um, organizations such as UNICEF, the kinds of teams of people working on the same problem that we're trying to solve. So I wanted to kind of leverage that a bit instead of starting from scratch. One of the things, for example, that we really like on this one, and I'll show you the, the actual website, that you can see here, um, that they really, it's really well achieved in terms of many um, hierarchy navigation. So you can see clearly that there's three main areas that, you know, are more prominent. Um, and the secondary goals are easy to spot from a typography perspective, it's smaller, different font, not as bold, but also from a background perspective. So that's really clear. And if you go mobile, Hopefully it's corporates. You, know, you get the donation button kind of sticking out of the navigation, and you still maintain the hierarchy within the mobile menu, which is also very important. So we really like this, this example, and we did you know, um, use this reference to, to our final kind of problem. Um, Second, we have UNICEF still, and uh, UNICEF US. Uh, so what these guys did really well were uh, corporate so they, they achieve what we're, I was discussing before. In every page you have call to actions available. Um, the hierarchy between the two call to actions is distinguishable. You can see clearly that, although it's not very visible here, that the nation is clearly the main thing. It's red, powerful, primary. Uh, and you have a more secondary, uh, turned down call to action, which is, in this case, help us. It's kind of the, um, you know, volunteer as well. Um, they also have a sticky nav. Um, so one of the things that we found interesting, not, not that sticky notes are particularly new. Um, let's see if I can find that here. Well, they just changed the homepage just now. <laughs> Donation time. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I hate when they do these things. It's like they make it really difficult, right? Eh? Okay. You can't close. You, you need to put some money first, I think. Uh, uh, well, this slows. I'll show you here. So, the thing about sticky notes um, is that if you have some sort of animation, for example, something that really gives a visual cue to the user to say, "Hey, I'm here," uh, and when you're scrolling down, the user kind of registers this. So. They know that if they need to donate, if they need to, you know, get some helpful information from, from, from the organization, that it's there. It's there with them and they follow up and, you know, as they scroll down, it's still there. Um, the responsive approach is still good as well, so the, the call to actions were, were still primary and still quite prominent in the mobile version, which was pretty good as well. Um, going a bit to the MSF, um, so MSF Poland, really tried to um, achieve exactly what we're trying to do. So they, they went for the new flat modern look, they changed the color to be kind of a darker color scheme, which is fun. Um, but they kind of overdid the animation stuff. So you go to this homepage, and I'm sure you've seen these kinds of examples where you go to this homepage, and it's a, kind of a, a big mess of, uh, you know, uh, hover states and, and moving things around, and, and really there's no hierarchy, again, which is again the same problem. So it's visually appealing, and one of the things that everyone agreed was that this is a good-looking website. But, again, difficult to really try and understand what, are, what is the hierarchy. Um, I had a really good story page layout, um, and, and a really good comment um, about this as well. Um, so, Australia.com was another one of the was provided by them. They liked kind of the, the clean, um, approach to this. It was a, they had a pretty good smart approach to typography. So basically, 
they only really had uh, you know special types for for titles. The rest was kind of base fonts, default fonts, which is pretty helpful when you're doing mobile apps. So in terms of performance uh, and, and so on. Uh, and they again had a good balance between primary and second navigation. Very good use of imagery, which was one of the things that they tried to achieve. And they, the way they approached um, their menus was through this kind of mega menu um, imagery. We're not totally convinced that this was the way to go, but we were trying to solve a problem in terms of our commercial architecture, which is often challenging. Is even labels sometimes are not good enough, and you know sometimes we need something more to tell the user what what they should expect when they click that one. Um, so. After we analyzed uh, some references, we started looking at some data. Uh, and like I said, the previous website was built on, completely built on assumptions. Nobody really looked at data. It was, you know, this is definitely the way to go. I think this is a great idea. Uh, let's just do this. Um, you know, the board thinks this is the way to go. Um, so nobody really looked at what was actually going on. And this is something that they themselves really wanted to change. Uh, one of the things that was amazing about this project was that the MSF team uh, was brilliant. Um, they were totally on track. They, we really cooperated, and it was kind of feeling that it was the same team, basically. Um, so questions that we started adding, asking was, what do users want? Uh, what inspires them to support the organization? Uh, and we kind of, ob obviously a bit biased, because that's kind of, you know, all marketing activities, AdWords campaigns are all aiming for this. But really, it's all about funders and recruitment. People do want to join. People do want to help. Sometimes, maybe not with donations, but with something else. But we want to find out, depending on the type of user that you are, how can I help? I don't want to make a donation, but maybe I can do something. And if there's you know, information available quickly accessible to support those types of users, then there are other out positive outcomes that can, um, can come from, from the entire user experience. Um, so some data-guided decisions. Um, what do visitors want? Um, they want um, recruitment information as stories for inspiration. This, this is kind of ordered by priority, so this was the main thing. Um, they want donation information facility and stories from inspiration. They want to read about what's going on in the world with MSF. They want information about who MSF is and what they stand for. Um, and they wanted a source of high relevance, high quality news and information. This is kind of contrasting with the other approach, which is what they don't want which is curious to look at, which is an archive of relevant, uh, relevant operational updates, reports and press releases, a breaking news wire for all MSF operations, and a website that only aids really industry-specific staff that can figure out how to navigate. So why stories? So the, the thing with first-person stories is that they, they really provide kind of a, a window to field realities in a way that everyone can relate to. They can inspire people to support, so they are they're engaging, they're relatable, um, they're emotional, they're authentic, they're proximal, which is the whole point of the entire user experience that we're trying to achieve. Institutional updates, on the other hand, are quite, you know, full of stats. They make MSF sound this kind of superhuman organization where patients almost become numbers. So it's quite less relatable, emotional, good person, and very statistical. Um, and this is, this is an interesting um, piece of data that they gave us. Um, of the people who read first-person stories from our field workers on the international blog, this is the um, international website blog from, from MSF, and click through to the msf.org.au, 71% went straight to our recruitment information. So 71% is a pretty impressive number. So we, we, we kind of really, really knew that this is was something that definitely we wanted to approach. Um, this was another yet very interesting piece of data that we found in the discovery stage. Um, this is a study by the University of Pennsylvania. And it suggested that more donations are generally focusing on simple technical vehicles. So these are you know, real people with a name and uh, with a face, etc. Uh, they increase um, the number of donations, um, while the statistical uh, personas, if you will, which are not you know not real people, but they represent a reality of an issue that's going on in the world, full of stats, full of you know there's. Uh, thousand people, a million people like, like this, um, they are not as engaging from a donation perspective. And one thing that we're really, really surprised is that if you get someone that is a tangible vi victim and you just put some stats, kind of like, you know, um, this, in the same situation as John, there are a million people that immediately decreases donation conversion, which is pretty impressive. We, we were completely unaware of this. Um, so that was interesting. Um, so obviously there was other types of research and activities, but the bottom line was we weren't really have um, as much um, 
weapons as we could when we get to the prototyping stage and really try and understand who NSF is, you know, what we're trying to achieve, who the users are, and what they're really related. Um, so we kicked in the prototyping stage. Um, we, in Digital Garden, we have several approaches to prototyping. It really depends on the project. Sometimes we go more low fidelity, sometimes higher fidelity. Um, for this project, um, as the user journey was really something that we're trying to get right and really map at each user direction, high fidelity was definitely the way to go, so we decided to go with a high fidelity of zero prototype. Um, and we obviously place everything in what we find. So before we kick that off, the most important piece of, of um, work that we could start doing was definitely we start working on that information architecture. Um, this is always something that requires quite a bit of iterations. We need the client for this. Um, we normally, when we're doing work like this, the client is kind of a really, really important piece of the puzzle. They know this better than we do. But we can criticize some decisions. We can criticize some different things that they think is a good idea, typically around even labeling of menus. So what we come up with is a very simplified uh, navigation. Um, so we have um, quite less options, um, way more easy to understand terms, like you know, join our team and their name and stories and news rather than field workers and things that people really don't know what, what they mean. And we start prioritizing high traffic areas of the website based on the data that we are analyzing. Um, so the homepage try to be bolder um, and simpler and focusing users in basically the two main goals, donations and join our team, and then the two secondary goals, read stories and subscriptions. Um, and, and one of the things that they were really hoping to get was to, for site managers, company managers, to be able to respond quickly to emergencies. So there's a, you know, an Ebola outbreak, and quickly they want to reshuffle their homepage. They really couldn't do that with their former CMS, um, and Drupal, you know, they started to, to see the power of, of what Drupal is, where, you know, in a couple of minutes you can really completely reshuffle your homepage. Because content, they do have all the content, but the workflows from a publishing perspective were, were quite more complicated. I'll show you. So this is you know, the final kind of prototype. So we get to this point, we go through several rounds of changes. Um, and this is what we show them, basically. This is kind of the mobile version. So as you can see, the good thing about doing mobile first is it's not so much which it is, obviously, it's better in terms of performance. Um, you, you really make sure that the elements that are mobile they stick on the desktop and you make decisions on mobile first. But really, for us, it's a lot about content hierarchy. This really allows us, it's a stacked version of a, of a website. So if, if you're trying to prioritize things, then really what's on top should be more important. What's on the bottom, bottom should be less important. And if we, if we start remembering those, those main goals and secondary goals, and you can see that you know, call to action is always present um, on mobile as well. Um, we can see um, that this is kind of a heading area so that they have somewhere to put, you know, emergency, there's an emergency, so this is kind of your, your banner area, your headline area. Primary uh, goal, second primary goal, some stories, which is our first secondary goal. And then
this project, it would be paragraphs. Paragraphs was absolutely paramount to the success of this. They, they, they wanted to have a great story layout, but they didn't want it to feel repetitive and boring. So by, because we do have an approach to design that's component-based, so we really don't build pages, um, we really start looking at what, you know, what can make a story, so like a plot book, a text, image gallery. It's up to the site manager to really kind of build like a Lego block uh, what the story is. So each story can actually look quite different. And they were extremely pleased with this. Um, so um, we wanted to make sure also that we had authorship and engagement tools. So if you're reading a story about a patient or a staff member, a nurse, sometimes you might want to you know, read a bit more about her. So using like things like entity reference to reference, um, you know, to relate a piece of content with the author. You go to the author, read a bit about the nurse, and then you have related stories, and this creates a cyclic approach where people are engaged and keep reading content, which is very interesting. That's one of the things they wanted to do as well as maintain users more time on the website. Uh, and then we just replaced some of the things that the older build had, like really difficult sharing options with a very kind of out-of-the-box share this or add this kind of tool to sort of let people um, share it to social media a bit easier. Um, and I, like I was saying, um, to bring a bit authors a bit more of a front so this kind of increases that emotional connection that I was talking about, you know, humanizing MSF a bit more. We clean you know, the nurses, uh, and, and it's my understanding that MSF is made of people, people that help, people that go everywhere in the world to, you know, to help other people. Um, so we wanted to make sure that stories were, you know, to really kind of ma make that um, transpire that stories are about people. They are from people, and they are to people. And this was really kind of a core uh, obviously, it enhances the first-person perspective. So you're reading a story that the nurse wrote, and, and then you read about her, and this kind of really connect, creates that emotional uh, connection. It also provides an alternate way of exploring stories. So if you want to see stories from a person's perspective, um, then you can go to her profile and see what she wrote about. Um, the other area, which was one of the things that I mentioned before, is we wanted to run, make sure that people understand what MSF is, what they're trying to do, where they are. So we wanted to kind of use map modules and things like that to start spreading out um, the different type of locations that MSF is. And again, this is yet another way to browse content. So if we go to the um, uh, country page, so this will be where your map is. So if you click on you know, Bangladesh, for example, then you read about MSF in Bangladesh, and then there will be you know, related stories on the bottom, tagged with that location. So again, cyclic approach to content. Um, we wanted to understand as well what issues MSF was working on, and these are typically very related to locations. So again, contextual navigation always present um, next to the location. So if you're reading about something in India, and there are types of issues that really relate to that location, then again, with taxonomy and references, we can make them. Donations is obviously pretty important. Um, we didn't have a lot of flexibility to work on this, um, on the actual donation form, because it is an external system. Um, so donation form, our role was mostly making sure that you know the layout was consistent with the rest. Uh, but we could support the donation process a bit better, better. And that was something that really didn't happen before. So before, if you went to donations, you just went straight to the form. No context, no information, just you know, fill in some, some data and put a credit card. So I wanted to be a bit more guided process. Um, you know, something like you choose kind of the type of donation that you're doing, um, and then if you want to read a bit more, you have other ways to give, promise the donor is the impact of the donation. You start having some supporting information around the donation process. We use this consistency. So what this means is, um, you know, when, when you have those websites that have like 30 content types or 40, and so that's what we're trying to get rid of here. Um, they had a lot of content types. Uh, content types were everything. Uh, it's like almost a title of the content type. So we want to make sure that we had way less content types, but they were more flexible. Um, so we, we ended up with, I don't know, five, something along those lines. Uh, but because of paragraphs, the consistency was great because really within each content type, the elements that each content type had in its majority were exactly the same. Um, so, you know, if, if you're building a gallery and, and, and a people content type has a gallery and a story has a gallery, the same component, really. And Paragraphs really brings that to the implementation side of things. Um, obviously, you create a lot of consistency in the approach to design, um, increase the benefits of scale, so every time you make a new component type, you can start reusing components from your component library. 
and simplify something that I didn't quite a bit. So it's not that kind of thing where should, should comment actually not be used, otherwise it would work well as it was being used. Um, okay, so design. So once we have a prototype, and the way our process works is this becomes the really the source of truth. This is kind of the Bible now. You know, we make sure that we do all this research, we do a bit of usability testing on top of this, there were focus groups, some surveys were done beforehand as well. Um, so you will really want to touch this too much in terms of structure, in terms of principle. So the design follows this. And one of the thing, good things that we have, or we join as well, is that having a UX designer that's working on the user experience process and then designs the interface is really a kind of a stream of consistent approach. So like I said, it's a component-driven design process uh, based on, you know, the protocol. And so, so cool. So putting a, excuse me, I am sure a lot of you guys know about them. We're one of the designers. We're not designing pages in the United States of companies. So we took kind of a bottoms-up approach. We start with you know, as granular as you can. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Brad Cork, Brad Cork's work, Atomic Design, we kind of follow the same principles. We start really granular from what he calls atoms, and then we start going up from there. Um, we really only arrive to pages quite later down the track. Um, we make sure that components are as context independent as possible, so that they are not, um, if you take a design component that only really works on that page, then it's really not context independent. Components should be, you know, functional and should work regardless of where it sits, and then obviously there are some variations and additions that need to be done on the context of a certain page or a certain header and so on. Um, and everything is supported by Drupal paragraphs. I can't really um, phrase this one more than that, to be honest. Um, Starting with the brands, so this, this is a, a really, really small sample of the multitude of things that we've had to look through in terms of brand guidelines that they have. Um, so we want to make sure that whatever we do is consistent with the guidelines that they provided. Um, we started moving on to master styles. So the way the way master styles work is we really start with the basic, the, the, you know, the type sets, the typography, the color palettes, and things like that. And only after we have that nailed down do we start creating um, more complex or the actual components. Uh, we start having a look at grid systems as well, and the types of grid systems that we or grid layouts that we're going to work with. Um, and when we're defining components. We typically build a style guide. I'll show you what I have on here. Okay. So I think nowadays we can do this automated from sketch, but at this time we're still doing this manually. So if you can see you have our color palette here, we have our type sets. And as you can see, the timesets are not like page one, page two, etc. They're actual breaking back characters. And why why do we do this? We do this because we want to make sure that our typography sets are independent as possible. So you know, if if you're building a, a heading one, then it might use one of these typesets with some variations on top. Um, and I'll explain that how we do this on the development side as well. Um, and then, if you get to typography, then yes, then you start seeing some font families or some, something like that. Okay, so... When we approach component design, we typically have two types of components. Uh, simple components will be those really granular components that really can't be divided. So, you know, links, things like that, they're, they're as small as they can be. And then you might have some complex components which are built with other components. So if you think about code-wise, for example, and each of your components on SAS or something is a separate file, then you might have other files that depend on other files. And this really maintains the consistency throughout the entire process. So some components could be sign up navigation, some teasers that they're built on several kind of elements. So for example, a small component could be um, you know, the author um, logo within the teaser, so when you see kind of the uh, author here on a story, for example, this could be a component that can be reused in, you know, elsewhere on the website, in multiple places. But this as well, the entire thing is a component, which is a really interesting approach, um, and it really helps us make sure that our design process matches our development process. We go into page layouts, so this is where also the grid systems start coming into play. So you can see a couple of them here. That's the home page layout versus uh, uh, 
of um, design itself. So what we start doing once we have all these nailed down is we start creating some concepts. So I'm going to show you a couple of them here. So this was one of the concepts. You can see that the call to actions were next to um, the slide or the, the, you know, the comment area. And then you can start going down and you have this kind of welcome text and you have later stories and so on. If you look at a concept B, this one's a bit different, which is this area is actually what we're just kind of in mind now. And then the latest, latest stories in the you know, list layout. So basically we're just kind of experimenting with cool things. And then this one, which is more in line with the classical MSF style, so the, the white, uh, clean white with red. And again, do different call, list, call to actions, later stories, and so on. So on every each of these approaches, they are still maintaining consistency with what we were discussing before. Okay, so sorry. Okay, some tools that we use. Sketch, Dropbox, that's pretty much what we use for every design. You can see a couple of things in Sketch here. So in terms of front-end development, it's exactly the same approach. So I, I'm not going to go into too much here because it really follows the exact same principles. We use implement the master styles first, uh, and then we start implementing the components in SAS, then we move to layouts, um, and then you know we try to use EMs versus pixels. We have some tools to make sure the conversions, make sure that our clutter process with designers is Streamlined, and we want to make sure that we avoid images as possible, so we use Fontel and things like that um, instead of really trying to make seconds. Some tools that we use for front ends, Omega theme, um, or at least we use on this one, we don't use it anymore on Google Play. Um, Season Grids, uh, SAS obviously, Type Heading, which is an amazing tool that I definitely recommend you guys checking out, uh, both by one of our front end developers. So you can see it here the abstraction on typesets. Uh, and the configuration for the several breakpoints that are available. So this is all kind of centralized in code as well. Um, okay, talking a bit about results um, to wrap it up. So I mentioned that before that there was some usability testing uh, done previously before we started the project. So one of the things where we give giving some, some information architecture activities and the results were basically that 61% of people could find what they were looking for. Um, the rest fell or gave up. Yeah. Uh, some critical feedback from uh, the CPS are difficult to navigate through the bottom of menus, they keep disappearing and, and things like that. And if you have a common option, which we now have with Discuss, um, menu headings are small and not obvious, difficult to see. I particularly like this one, this one, this one's my favorite. Sometimes I feel inadequate in my limited education and wonder if the site was designed by academic persons directed to other academic and people, rather than the ordinary, less educated majority such as myself. Good, good one. Um, so, after 91% of participants were able to successfully find all pages they were asked to, this is significant improvement versus the 61% that we had before. Uh, stories from our patients and staff, which is the focus now, receives more traffic than news from our projects or any other types of articles on the website. Um, and basically, we really ma managed to ma validate the hypothesis that first person stories are more engaging um, than operational news updates. Um, some critical feedback, it's easy to navigate, does not contain too much information, don't find the website frustrating at all, it's easy to navigate, properly design, very clear, easy to navigate. So easy to navigate kind of appears a lot, which is really good because that's really what we're trying to achieve. There's always more to do, but that's a good start. So some metrics, um, obviously there are other things that play a role in this, campaigns and things like that, but uh, overall 33% increase in visitors. We had a 52% increase in revenue, which is pretty impressive. 41% um, increase in number of donations, 7.68% increase in donation amount, and a 3.28% increase in donation conversion rate. So that's, that was, you know, obviously really made us happy. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that we started hearing about after we released the project is that everywhere in the world we started getting uh, feedback from other MSF branches 
uh, you know, okay, cool, what did you guys do? We want to do the same, uh, which is awesome. So we got amazing feedback from everywhere in the world, from, you know, South Africa to Germany to, to wherever. Uh, and, and, you know, starting to not just want to make the website look like this, but really what was the process that you guys went through? And this is, I, I think, the critical part of, of the project. I really want to thank the MSF team. I think this is, this is probably the most important thing in my entire presentation. There is no success that's not possible without this. Uh, you know, these guys are amazing. They, they were really, you know, sold into, let's do this. This is, you know, we are a team together. Um, amazing digital team. Um, they were really on board with, with, you know, the whole mobile first. And sometimes people might be a bit resilient on some of these things. But they were fully supportive throughout the entire journey. And, and I think... To get results like this, you really, you know, there's really no other way because as good as we might think we are, we don't know, you know, uh, fundraising as good as they do, we don't know the users, we don't know the audience, and they know that really, really well. So they, if they're willing to play ball with us and share that knowledge and do some workshops and really have a really collaborative approach, then, you know, the results really speak for themselves. Um, and that, that's it. All right, we've got about um, five minutes for a question, so um, please put your hand up if you have a question, wait for the microphone to come uh, to you, and just hold on to the microphone until you, your question is over. Thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, how long did it take to do the whole uh, wireframing and the study? And uh, and did you have to migrate a lot of content from the previous website to the new one? So, yeah, so um, in terms of timelines, I think the entire project has been working for three months or so, three, three months, four months. Um, and as it's kind of typical with our process, the discovery process, the prototyping process takes a big part of that. So we really start preparing to use it as a of time. Let's spend time here. You know, let's, let's, let's really spend as much time as we can really trying to understand this. And if you get to a prototype like that and you respect it, which is also very important, it's easy to do an amazing prototype and then just, you know, bash it when you get the design because it doesn't look right. So we really need to make sure that we respect the findings that, that we have. Uh, then the actual development process takes quite, you know, quite short time. Really. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, migration of content. So the migration was on my own uh, One of the things that they wanted to do was take the opportunity to just remove almost so um, there was, we could have done an kind of migration process, but it would be difficult to match, especially for things like paragraphs, because the content is still to set up uh, areas. But they really didn't even consider that approach. They wanted to say, you know, let's give, they already have the CMS, so it was one of the things that we wanted to do before we had front end. If, you know, even when the site looks really, really bad, we give access to clients with the stock of the content. And that's really kind of, you know, nurtures our kind of first approach. We start seeing issues a bit further than, you know, Thank you. Any other questions? That was a great and a very positive story. So I just wanted to know if what were the challenges, what were the things that that, that caused more pain and you resolved? So it's kind of true. Like, you know, sometimes we really don't understand, you know, when we when they need something that they're using a lot of, you know, specific kind of jargon that we want to make sure that they say it, we really don't understand what you're saying. And we just think, you know, we, we don't know this. We will learn, and that's what we do every day every project that we take is completely different from finance to, you know, legal to whatever. Uh, so that's definitely one of the challenges. Um, the other challenge was working with the existing bills. That was a pretty big challenge. <laughs> right. So that's and that's always the best when we take something that really exists. Trying to really, you know, understand what's there. There were some pretty naughty things done in that build um, that should be there. So we, we wanted, although it's more more of a front end exercise and user experience, we, we went a bit further and we couldn't have quite many things. Um, we removed a lot of modules I think they had what was it? Two hundred and all of them was were just being used. So that was challenging because we had to spend time and sometimes this could be some elsewhere to really try and have a clean starting point. Um, I think those were the major ones. The rest, 
like I said, with the client, it was, it was so good. I, you know, like when you get a client like that, it's just a good thing. Thank you. I was going to ask you, um, the prototype you had, is that a tool or how, how did you? Okay, it's very nice. Yeah, it's really nice. Okay. So it really depends on, sometimes it's a bit of a regular thing, you just turn it off and things like that. Mm. And then the next day, you're going to do this and do some more, so you can just get more about it. So you can just get whatever, just get on the other process and kind of get it the same as doing this kind of interaction. But when you know that, so you get to the point where you know more or less what you're doing, and you're lying to yourself, 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 so it's not just about you know, like a wireframe or things to see it come to pass. You can do mm. sequential um, mm. things like that that are not relevant from the user tools perspective. And it also has a really good response to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I've got a um, quick question for you. Um, being a, a multinational client, uh, in the back of your mind, were you, um, obviously you wanted to do a great job, but were you, in the back of your mind, were you thinking, well, if we do a really good job here, we might end up you know, working for some of the other regions? Uh, I think that was, um, that was, um, that was, I think it was really more about two things that we were seeing. One of the things was really, these guys are using them. This is amazing. Let's, let's, let's really show that we can do um, a good looking website. And, and it's one of the things that sometimes we find with clients that they may have this perspective that because it's a Google, it needs to look bad. Uh, because they, they are, you know, it's all legal, kind of like what's the whole thing, it's all legal, it's all legal things. Uh, so, having the ability to show that someone is good in organization is not like that itself. Obviously, you know, you get other measures to work less than great, but it's also a great way to show other types of clients to other workers that you can have, you know, bigger measures and an amazing information site with good results and can really focus on these two types of things rather than just the development side of things. Any last questions? All right. Um, please, a big uh, round of applause again for Joanne. All right, and don't forget that uh, all these talks are going up on the website uh, in about a week, um, so please share them uh, with your colleagues. Thank you.